Dr. Bolin back here with you for another session of Microbiology Boot Camp. Our topic today is going to be Group B Beta Hemolytic Strep, otherwise known as S.A. Galactiae. If you're watching these in sequence, we already covered S. pyogenes, which is the Group A Beta Hemolytic Strep. This is very similar as far as what it looks like when you plate it. Uh, but it's very different as far as the diseases that it caused. This is an infection primarily of neonates. And so you're gonna see this as you go on to do your clinical rotations. This is gonna be very important. They'll talk about it a lot in pediatrics and neonatology, and it will come up in obstetrics because there is some obstetric management that we do that implicates this bacteria. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. This is hopefully gonna be a pretty short video because there's not as much that you need to know Contrast that to group A strep, which I actually kept that concise. I recorded it twice to try to keep it concise, and uh, 40 minutes was the best I could do. So all of that stuff, hopefully you sat through it because it's packed with high-yield information. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please uh, consider going to my Patreon and uh, chipping in a dollar a month. I really appreciate it. A little bit goes a long way to help offset the cost of these videos. Uh, you can get there by clicking on this button on the upper right hand corner or in the link below in the description of the video. Uh, as you know, I've been making my videos free for the last eight years. I really believe in free resources, especially nowadays with the pandemic going on. We need educated providers and I know that when you're in med school or nursing school or uh, mid-level providers, uh, you, you guys don't make hardly any money, if any money at all. and so. You know, they charge hundreds of dollars for some of these resources that you only get access to for a limited amount of time, and I just don't believe in that. So I've always made my videos free for you, but I definitely appreciate voluntary donations, and uh, if you can't do that, I totally get it. I was broke once upon a time when I was in medical school, and um, I get how it is, uh, but if you can't, just at least uh, consider... Uh, subscribing to my page or patronizing my advertisers. I, I really appreciate it. So thanks in advance. All right, we're not going to talk about the distinctions between positive and gram positive and gram negative bacteria, but just know that all of this stuff is very heavily testable. Uh, I talk about the characteristic features of gram positive bacteria, the general features in another video, so you can go back and watch that. This is how you gram stain. Remember that gram staining is not the only way to distinguish bacteria, but it is by far the most important. You need to know all your gram positive bacteria from gram negative. If you don't know that, you're not even gonna be able to start to approach a step one question. Um, there are other stains that you do, as you know, uh, the famous acid fast stain, and then there are other bacteria that really don't stain at all with gram stain. Uh, intracellular bacteria, for instance, you may have difficulty staining, so. Um, so you should know your gram stain, but uh, I talk about the details of that in the other video. Okay, so we're going to go over the classification, work our way down our algorithm. You should know your algorithm cold. There's a gram positive algorithm and gram negative algorithm. I've got uh, I've, I've got it on here for you that I made, uh, but you can find a lot of them on online uh, that are all pretty good. We'll talk about the characteristics. You've got to know all your characteristics, virulence factors, toxins for all your bacteria. You know, their characteristics also of the viruses that have virulence factors, fungi, parasites. Uh, you'll need to know all of that stuff for step one, and it helps to know as far as how it causes disease. Thankfully, group B strep is pretty concise and pretty simple as far as uh, its, its microbiology is concerned. We'll talk about the diseases. Uh, they're all in neonates, and then we'll do a story. I'm, like I said, not a very creative person, but I put together a story for you. Hopefully you'll like it, help uh, anchor all of this stuff and help you remember it. And then we're actually not gonna do a question this time because all of this stuff is pretty basic. And I tried putting together a question, but I couldn't put a challenging one together for you. Uh, so eventually when I do a review video, we'll probably have a group B strep question, but all of this stuff should make sense to you when we're done uh, with this video. So instead, we'll do a quick review comparing group A and group B strep. This is your algorithm. So you 
you culture bacteria, you, you, you plate it on your slide and uh, you do your gram stain. Uh, there are three big classes of gram positive bacteria, the bacilli, which are rods, the branching filaments, which is exactly what it sounds like, and then the cocci. Once you have a cocci, you can determine whether it's strep or staph based on its morphology or a catalase test. You should know that staph form clusters. They are catalase positive always, and strep are always catalase negative. They form uh, chains. Once you know you're dealing with strep, you're going to put it on sheet blood auger and determine its hemolysis pattern. If it's partial hemolysis, which will give you a green sheen to it, you know you're dealing with Alpha hemolytic strep, that can be viridans group or strep pneumo. I did videos on that too. You can go back and watch that. If it's complete hemolysis, then you know it's beta hemolysis. And that's the topic of this video, particularly group B strep. Um, but group A strep is also hemolytic. It'll look identical on the sheet blood auger. So you have uh, to do another test to determine, um, to, to be able to differentiate them. And there are two ways that you can do that, which we'll go into in the next slide. Okay, so the big mnemonic here is B bras. Please know this. Please know all, you got to know all your, your uh, antibiotic sensitivity tests for the step because this is very high yield and they'll throw it at you all the time. Your mnemonic is B bras. The first B for bacitracin. Remember that beta hemolytic, you do a bacitracin sensitivity test. And then the BRAS just means group B is resistant and group A is sensitive. So here we're talking about bacitracin resistant beta hemolytic strep. What is beta hemolysis? It's just complete hemolysis. So you plate it on sheep blood auger, you've got complete hemolysis of the red blood cells. That stands in contrast to alpha hemolytic where you have partial hemolysis and then hydrogen peroxide which denatures the remaining hemoglobin uh, and that gives you that sort of green sheen to it. And then the gamma hemolysis is just it's kind of a misnomer. It's not hemolytic at all, or at most variable hemolysis, and that will be the topic of our next video. This is everything we just talked about. This is all of the characteristics of beta hemolytic strep. You could have this thrown at you on your exam where they give you all of these features, and then you need to know uh, that or what the, uh, the species is that you're dealing with. So they may not tell you group B strep, you may get a question, which is a vignette, and you know that it's group B uh, beta hemolytic strep, for instance, and you'll need to be able to tell them that it's gram-positive coccyne chains, catalase negative, complete hemolysis, and it's bacitracin resistant. So you've got to know all this stuff. That's why it really helps to have that algorithm. Okay, the big feature for group B strep that you can get thrown at you, and a lot of med students fail to remember this, is that group B strep is CAMP positive. CAMP does not stand for cyclic AMP. It stands for Christy Atkins Munch Peterson, which were four people that discovered this, this feature of group B strep. And what group or what CAMP is, is it's a factor that enhances hemolysis. So the way you can tell that it's CAMP positive is you plate staph aureus and you, you draw a line while you're plating it down the middle of the auger. And then you take your beta hemolytic strep that you don't know what, whether it's, it's group B or group A, and you draw a line from one side to the other perpendicular to your staph aureus line. Remember, staph aureus is also beta hemolytic, even though it's not strep. And if you're dealing with group A strep, you'll just see that line perpendicular to the staph aureus line. If you're dealing with uh, group B beta hemolytic strep, what you'll see is this enhanced zone of hemolysis, and that's because CAMP enhances the hemolysis of Staph aureus. So you get this extra zone of clearing alongside uh, your group B strep line and your Staph aureus line, and that is CAMP. Okay? It does not stand for cyclic AMP, it's CAMP, CAMP factor positive. Group B strep is CAMP factor positive. Other virulence factors for strep A galactiae or group B strep are its capsule. So this is an encapsulated bacteria, just like group A strep, just like strep pneumo, and it's a polysaccharide capsule. So unlike group A strep, this is a polysaccharide capsule. Remember, group A strep was a hyaluronic acid capsule. And like all capsules, it inhibits phagocytosis. Now the cool thing about capsules is that we can take the components of the capsule and we can use them to make a vaccine. And we've already done that with strep pneumo, but we haven't done that unfortunately yet with strep acoactiae, but it is in progress. They're trying to do it right now. Hemolysin is analogous to streptolysin O, which you see in strep pyogenes. 
and that lyses cell membrane. So it does the exact same thing. It's what allows group B strep to be beta hemolytic. And then we already talked about cancer. All right, these are the diseases caused by group B strep. The big one is neonatal sepsis. Now, sepsis is very difficult to diagnose, and it's hard enough to diagnose in an adult. It is a pain in the ASS to diagnose it in a neonate because Neonates and children to some degree don't have fully developed immune systems yet, or at least they're not developed like adults, um, young children and neonates. And so you're not going to see all the characteristic symptoms that you would see in an adult. And remember that adage in pediatrics that children are not small adults. It is so true, and it's even more true in neonates. So whereas in an adult you would expect to see hypotension and fever, elevated white count, when you're dealing with sepsis, you don't necessarily see that in neonates. In fact, the most salient symptom of neonatal sepsis is respiratory distress, even if you're not dealing with a primary respiratory illness. So respiratory distress is the most common symptom. Remember, you're going to see flaring and retractions and grunting and uh, a, a drop in the oxygen saturation, increased need for oxygen to keep the sats up. So that's the number one symptom you see in, in neonatal sepsis. Now, all sepsis has a cause, even if you can't identify it. And the two big causes that group B strep causes are neonatal pneumonia and neonatal meningitis. Neonatal pneumonia is characterized by respiratory distress, just like sepsis. What you'll see is infiltrates on chest x-ray. Now, infiltrates are not... Pneumonia is not the only thing that can cause infiltrates. Uh, there's respiratory distress of the newborn, which can cause a similar a picture on chest x-ray. Uh, but this is far and away the most common cause of these kinds of infiltrates, so neonatal pneumonia. If you've got a patient that's got respiratory distress, you're getting a chest x-ray no matter what. And this is what pneumonia will look like. Neonatal meningitis is uh, another cause of neonatal sepsis. Group B strep is the number one cause of neonatal meningitis, just like it's the number one cause of neonatal sepsis. You get a lumbar puncture if you suspect sepsis, uh, and then the lumbar puncture, like adults, thank God, is the same. It's high protein, low glucose, positive white count uh, on your your uh, on your lumbar puncture in your CSF analysis. So I like to remember bacterial meningitis as having a high protein, low glucose, and positive white count, as opposed to viral meningitis uh, by this way. So both viral and bacterial meningitis will show a high protein in the lumbar puncture. Okay, great. Glucose is what will be different. So with viral meningitis, your glucose will be normal. With bacterial meningitis, it'll be low. And the way I remember it is that bacteria eat glucose. And so if you have bacteria in your CSF, your glucose will be low. And then your white count will be elevated. The treatment for neonatal sepsis, as well as neonatal pneumonia and neonatal, neonatal meningitis is ampgent. Ampicillin gentamicin. Can't go wrong with that. Ampicillin in particular is what goes after strep agalactiae. And the ampicillin, you always include it anyway because it also covers listeria, which is another cause of neonatal sepsis. Okay, so important fact here uh, is that the baby gets group B strep from the birth canal. And so there's a certain proportion of women who are naturally colonized with group B strep. And so what we do is at 35 weeks, and this is going to be important in your OB rotation, at 35 weeks we culture the vagina and the perineum and the rectum. And then we see if she's group B strep positive or negative. And if she is group B strep positive, we give her intrapartum penicillin always. So while she's in labor, we give her uh, intrapartum penicillin. And that will negate the possibility, almost negate the possibility of a group B strep infection in her baby. If she's allergic to penicillin, you can give her a first generation cephalosporin like cephalex, and that's fine too. These are the pathogens that cause meningitis in children. Obviously here we're dealing with a neonate. Group B strep is the number one cause. Also gram-negative bacilli. What do you know about gram-negative bacilli? You can get it from the birth canal. All right, so our story is going to take place on the moon. And I chose the moon because it's in outer space, and in space you see galaxies. And galaxy sounds a lot like a galactiae, which is the name for group B strep, strep a galactiae.
And on the moon is uh, our, our little baby who decided that he wanted to come to the moon. He got tired of Earth and he wanted to come to the moon to explore. And this is baby B. Baby B for group B strep. When you think group B strep, think group baby strep because it affects babies, in particular neonates. And because he didn't want to get lonely, he brought around his stuffed animal like babies tend to do and play with their toys. And this is not just any stuffed animal. This is his stuffed hippo. Hippo for hippurate positive. Group B strep is hippurate hydrolysis positive. Now, after a long day of exploring the moon, he needs to go back to his tent and camp out. Group B strep is camp positive. And like anybody who goes to the moon, got to have oxygen. And uh, to have oxygen, he needs to have a capsule helmet. So this baby has a capsule helmet. And not only is it a capsule, but it's a polysaccharide capsule. And I indicated that here by putting this baby's dinner for tonight. His dinner is sugar. So a sugar capsule or a polysaccharide capsule. Notice this meteor that's coming down to the moon, and it kind of looks like a red blood cell that's breaking up in the atmosphere. It's breaking up because it's hemolyzing. Group B strep is hemolysin positive, which allows it to be beta hemolytic. We gave the baby a shield to defend himself from any kind of bacitracin monsters that are on the moon. And this baby, because he's got a shield, is now resistant to bacitracin. Group B strep, resistant to bacitracin. Group A strep, sensitive. He's gotten a little sick from his time on the moon, from uh, crawling around for the last several hours. And his first symptom is that he's got a cough. Notice how it's steaming up his his capsule helmet. Uh, so a cough is a, a symptom of pneumonia and group B strep causes pneumonia in neonates. He's crawling away from this septic yellow puddle and that's because the number one cause of neonatal sepsis is group B strep. Neonatal sepsis, number one cause. He's also got a band-aid on his back from injuring his back, and that's because of meningitis. Group B strep is the number one cause of neonatal meningitis. Now when he gets back to his campsite, he's going to jam out to some music, and what better way to do that than with an AMP. AMP stands for ampicillin. You're going to add ampicillin to the standard of care for any neonate in whom you ex uh, suspect a group B strep infection. Oh no, look who's coming. It's the mothership, the purple penicillin mothership. Purple pencils on the mothership. And who is in that mothership? Well, it's his mother. His mother is coming to the moon to pick up her baby. And his mother also happens to be pregnant. She's 35 weeks pregnant, knowing that she probably could have prevented her baby from going to the moon if she had been cultured for group B strep when she was 35 weeks pregnant. If the mother is group B strep, when, she, uh, when uh, she's found to be group B strep when she's 35 weeks pregnant, we give her the purple pencil penicillin at uh, intrapartum. So penicillin intrapartum, and that will uh, reduce the risk of passing on group B strep to her baby and reduce the risk of neonatal meningitis, sepsis, and pneumonia caused from group B strep. So there is your story.